Howdy, and welcome to Bamberger Ranch. My name is Roel Lopez. I'm the director of the Texas A&M Natural Resources Institute, and we're going to continue our Leopold Live series here at Bamberger, continuing to talk about the five basic tools introduced by Aldo Leopold, the father of wildlife management. These five tools include cow, axe, plow, uh, fire, and gun. And what we hope to do in the upcoming months is show you how those tools can be applied, but with very specific projects and objectives. And so with me is Dr. April Sampson. She's the executive director of Bamberger, and she's gonna tell us a little bit about Bamberger and what we hope to cover in the series. Great, thank you so much, Roel. We're really excited to have you and your colleagues from the Natural Resources Institute back here at Sela Bamberger Ranch Preserve. And we're excited about continuing our journey into Leopold Live version two. Like Roel said, we'll be uh, providing more detail and more useful information regarding the five tools that Aldo Leopold championed. Here at Sela Bamberger Ranch Preserve, we're a 501c3 nonprofit organization, and our mission is landowner stewardship, outreach, and environmental education. So we have uh, many Central Texas school children that come visit us every year uh, for hands-on science-based environmental education lessons, and we also lead uh, showcase tours and workshops for landowners interested in practicing restoration and good land stewardship. Um, so we're very happy to be partnering with Natural Resources Institute um, and we hope that we know that you'll benefit a lot from the information that we are going to be um, talking about during this new version of Leopold Live. So let's go ahead and get started. Great. Hi there, I'm April Sansom and I am so pleased to introduce a very special guest visiting us at Sela Bamberger Ranch Preserve today. <coughs> we have David K. Langford, conservationist well known throughout the state of Texas, former CEO of the Texas Wildlife Association, extraordinarily talented photographer, and longtime lover of wildlife and landscapes here in the state of Texas. So thank you so much, David, for being out here with us today, and we're glad to see you out here at SELA. Thank you for inviting me. All right, so one of the reasons why we um, are so pleased to have David out here with us today because he is essentially the champion in the state of Texas for the wildlife valuation program that many landowners um, utilize as part of their toolbox uh, for their land management. And so we're very grateful for all the work that he's done on that. And we're gonna ask him today to talk to us a little bit about the history of the wildlife valuation program and his role in that and how it all sort of got started back in the day. It did. It was back in the day. Seems like yesterday, but it was a long time ago. This is kind of a camp star, campfire story. I wish we had a, it was, you know, cooler weather and we could, were all sitting around a campfire because it's really a campfire story. The wildlife evaluation started as best we can determine two conversations. One was around a borrowed dining room table which served as the conference table for the Texas Wildlife Association in 1988 in our minuscule offices that we had. And uh, at that conference table were Steve Lewis and a certified wildlife biologist, Garner Fuller, uh, now deceased, uh, died way too young. And this whole idea was Garner Fuller's idea. He is the originator of what has happened since 1988 till now. He made the comment sitting around that table, wouldn't it be nice if you got the same little bug from the pecan tree, if you got the same 
uh, 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 tax valuation, property tax valuation, if you by providing habitat for deer, just like you do if you provided habitat for goat. At the same time, uh, we were not aware of it at the time, but there were two parks and wildlife biologists in deep east Texas. Carl Frentress, also now deceased, and Kay Fleming were talking to their state representative, their new state representative, Clyde Alexander. You want to remember that name. Well, I'm not sure what happened over there in East Texas after that, but what happened at Texas Wildlife Association, we went to see the then Speaker of the Texas House, Gib Lewis. This was in uh, late 1990. And we uh, approached him with the idea of a wildlife valuation for property taxes. And he said, well, come back and see us when the session starts. So in 1990, we went back in, again in his office, and we had a conversation about how we thought it would work. And while we were in his office, he picked up the telephone and called the chairman of the calendars committee in the Texas House, who was Representative Hugo Berlanga from Corpus Christi. It doesn't matter how good an idea or legislation you have, if you can't get it on the calendar, it goes nowhere. So Gib Lewis was a rancher. Hugo Berlanga had a ranch. And we discussed that with uh, the two of them, and then they decided they would ask a very powerful uh, senator Bill Sims to carry it in the carry the bill in the in the uh, in the Senate, Texas Senate. Bill Sims at the time was the executive director of the Texas Sheep and Goat Raisers. So this notion from the very beginning has an agricultural base. You have three ranchers, and a, one of them is CEO of Sheep and Goat Raisers who are carrying this legislation in the, in, the, in the Texas legislature. And there were three promises made by all of us associated with this. And that was that this was not a way to cheat on your taxes property. Uh, it, it was always meant to be, there was three things. Number one, it was revenue neutral. In 1991, it was the first year that the that the, uh, the the legislature was called the the uh, Robin Hood legislature because we decided the, the citizens of Texas decided that they would how they would pay for public education. So it had to be revenue neutral, or it was dead on arrival. Number two, you had to work hard, just like you did at your agricultural operation. You had to work hard at your wildlife operation. And the last thing was that it was for all species of wildlife. Nobody envisioned that anyone availing themselves of this agricultural valuation, wildlife valuation, nobody ever envisioned that we, uh, they would abandon their agricultural practice. This was an ag-based idea. The whole idea was, at that time, the appraisal districts all had intensity tests, and to get an ag valuation, you basically had to ruin your land. You had the stocking ratio were so terrible that you had to just eat up your landscape in order to get a tax break. So this was a this was an, a way originally to balance your operation. You could use cattle, for example as your habitat management um, guideline, your habitat management program and under a wildlife valuation, and just reduce your stocking rate and have be better for your livestock operation and better for wildlife and natural resources and water and everything. That's how it started. Well, to everyone's amazement, House Bill 1298 passed. So then it goes through the other processes 
and it kind of got in trouble with the governor's office, or Governor Ann Richards at the time, and we were able to solve that. And then it got in, in trouble because the property tax board, now this is previous to property taxes being taken care of by the comptroller's office, the property tax board, they basically said in a nutshell, well, this is fine and dandy, but the wildlife that you're providing habitat for, you have to eat. And the joke started around that, well, we're our golden cheek warbler's taste, but <laughs> we're not, we don't want to find out how they taste. So it was not the idea. So Gib Lewis is still speaker, and he says, well, give us a chance in the 93 session and we'll fix this, because we'll fix all the problems that, that this bill is making for the property tax board. Well, we ran out of time, and it didn't happen, and it didn't get a bill filed in 93, so now we moved to 95. And that's House Bill 1358 in 95, sponsored by Representative Clyde Alexander, there's that name, and Senator John Monford over in the Senate. Again, we made the same three promises all over the place. Revenue neutral. No way we could take money away from the education funding. You had to work hard at it. You could not put up a hummingbird feeder and move to the Cayman Islands and receive your work at it just like you had to work, work with your ag value, your ag, ag, ag operation. And it was for all species of wildlife, including endangered species that you didn't have to eat. It turns out the only way that that could be accomplished was a constitutional amendment. It was unfixable in legislation. The only way to make those criteria constitutional was to have a constitutional amendment. So the legislation, author, uh, 1358, authorized a constitutional amendment. So there again, we, we, uh, we started going around the state and gathering allies, and we started, uh, we had a program, we had a chartered airplane, and we went to all the editorial boards and media outlets and uh, newspapers and TV stations all over the state. So on that, in that uh, charter airplane, we started calling ourselves the Proposition 11 World Tour. We, had, <laughs> we, had, we, we were kind of like rock stars. Everywhere we went, they turned lights on and stuck microphones in front of us, and it was kind of fun. Uh, and Proposition 11 was our position on the ballot, which was a bad enough deal because it was kind of at the end, and generally when you're voting on constitutional propositions, when you get to the end, you're tired of trying to make your mind up and just go ahead and vote against something. So we were, we were worried about all that. Made the same three promises on all of the editorial boards in front of all those microphones under all those lights, revenue neutral, had to work hard at it, and it was all species of wildlife. Made those same three promises. We put together a coalition of ag and and uh, conservation. I mean, it was a spectrum. We had the Farm Bureau on one side and the Sierra Club on the other side, and about 50 or 60 groups in between. It was a very widely supported notion, and we ended up passing the the uh, constitutional amendment uh, by and uh, by 62 to 38, which is a pretty good pretty good win and no matter what the game is. So um, then the comptroller, uh, 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 who at that time uh, became Susan Combs, and Susan Combs was one of the people on the airplane, along with Clyde Alexander and uh, Bob Turner, who was a, another co-sponsor of the House of Representatives of, of uh, 1358. And there are a couple of their uh, legislative aides, Lance Lively, uh, Billy Howe was on the tour. There were there were, uh, there was a plane full of people that were making sure that the voters got out and, and supported this. The comptroller then wrote guidelines. Uh, they suggested guidelines, and then the Parks and Wildlife Department completed those guidelines, and it went along pretty good for several years. And then guess what happened? People start cheating on it. Imagine that. So you, in fact, did have people 
who decided they would just, you know, kind of abandon their ranch and do whatever else they wanted to go ahead and do. And then you had developers and home builders that were, you know, putting things in wildlife with no intention of ever doing anything. So there came along now in 2001 where we decided uh, those in charge decided they needed to fix the people, uh, fix the, the deals where you couldn't cheat on it anymore. And what happened then was, was uh, Representative Clyde, that name again, he filed House Bill 3123 at the absolute last minute right in front of the filing deadline that fixed all of those issues. And it almost went nowhere, except that at the last minute, Kirby Brown, who was still at the Parks and Wildlife Department, offered language that satisfied the Comptroller's Office and satisfied the Appraisal District and satisfied the legislature, and the bill was passed. So now, what had been guidelines, which you could abridge without any ramifications, became the law. Uh, you know, the, the comptroller now has rules that you have to follow in order to, to qualify and maintain this ag value. Now that's 2001, and this is 2021, 10 years later, and it needs to be tweaked. And there's an, there's an effort of, of several, but among uh, probably the most likely to succeed, the Texas chapter of the Wildlife Society. Uh, their uh, Tear Institute, named after uh, our friend Jim Tear, is looking into how we might make this program, in fact, unique and make it a Texas program that ends up doing what it's intended to do because the appraisal districts really don't know how to administer it. Uh, there's very few people out there other than a few consultants that know how to help and the Parks and Wildlife Department that know how to help landowners comply. So there's a move afoot right now which uh, I think everyone is very supportive of to try to make it an in fact unique Texas program may be exportable to uh, the rest of the country whereby it's easy to understand it is the law and the appraisal district and the landowners all have to comply with it and uh, that I don't know how that's going to end up it just it just beginning and we're looking forward to it that's the story for me that's the history that's amazing I can't imagine anybody in a better position than you to share that story with us and we um, it's so valuable to know the history of that so we really Thank you for telling us that story today, even despite the fact that we don't have a campfire going right now. <laughs>When you think about wildlife valuations and you think about tax valuations, you have to understand the difference between the 1D and the 1D1 valuation. The 1D valuation came around in 1966. Urban sprawl was forcing a lot of the um, farmers where their, their, their property taxes were actually more expensive than the income they were making off their farm. So the Texas legislature stepped up, formed a constitutional act that, that gave way to this 1D agricultural valuation. So when you think 1D, think agricultural valuation. And that ag valuation does have a couple stipulations. The first thing is that land has to be used for agriculture. And when we think about agriculture, thinking about grazing, thinking about crops, think about mass producing trees like pecans or, or oranges or pomegranates, okay? Um, or even grass and flowers, anything that comes from the soil is gonna be in agriculture. Second, that property has to be owned by a person, not a corporation. Corporations do not qualify for the 1D valuation. That person who owns that property has to make over 50%, 50% or over of their, their yearly income from that property in agricultural valuation, okay? All of those things need to happen and then you can get your um, agricultural valuation. And that again is different than the 1978 act that brought in the 1D1. 1D1 is the open space act. 
And what that open space allowed was for Texas landowners that didn't want to run a thousand head of goats on their 60 acre farm um, to, to lessen the load. So you can change the density and you can change the intensity because of that open space valuation. That open space valuation is a county by county thing. And that's what's really um, the most complicated part of the 1D1 system is no matter where you are in the state of Texas, your county appraisal is going to have a, a cheat sheet for you. And that's going to cheat sheet is based on your eco region. So when you think why it's done that way, well, think of rainfall. If you have a farmer in Harris County, they have to produce 87 bushels of corn per acre. Harris County gets a lot more rain than Travis County does. So that same farmer who wants to, wants to use their, their um, land for corn has to produce 67 bushels of corn per acre. So the state is kind of adjusting um, for that rainfall, for that management, um, according to where you are. So that open space then leads to your wildlife valuation that we just heard the history of from David Langford. Now with that wildlife valuation, you have to have a 1D or you have to have a 1D1 open space valuation for five of the last seven years. So you're allowed two years of deferment, okay? So when you think of that, that 1D, that land has to be used for agricultural for three years before you can get the 1D valuation. The 1D1, five of the last seven. And you can switch back and forth once you have them. That's really important too, because that, that, to, that leads us then to the um, wildlife valuation. And the state set those wildlife valuations up to be better for the landscape, right? To adjust for those people that maybe don't want to run goats out here. So that wildlife valuation is based on managing the habitat for indigenous or native species. And the state can't tell you what species you want to manage for because that land has to be used for human use. When you think of human use, think of food, think of medicine, or think of recreation. If you like to bird, uh, bird watch, if you like to, like I do, if you like to go out and find um, reptiles and amphibians, that qualifies for recreational use. You think of food, you want to hunt a white-tailed deer, native species, you, can, you, you eat that if you want to manage for your fish in the creek, all of that stuff qualifies. Now there's guidelines for this. Texan Parks and Wildlife has worked with the, with the um, state and they've established seven guidelines. So when you think about those guidelines that the Texas Parks and Wildlife has established, there's seven of them. The first being habitat control or habitat management. The second, erosion control. Then you have supplemental food, supplemental water, supplemental shelter, censusing, and finally predator control. Okay, all of those things. You have to do three of those seven to qualify and keep your 1D1 wildlife management valuation. So that's really important to remember. And this whole series, this whole Leopold Live series um, is gonna focus on usage of those seven techniques for benefit of wildlife across the state. So I hope you, you uh, stay tuned for future episodes. So David, can you talk a little bit about what some of the uh, most useful provisions of the wildlife valuation program in its form today are for landowners? What are some of the highlights? Well, everything begins with the condition of the land. And this valuation unquestionably makes the landscape healthier than it would be without it. So even if they are not doing the agricultural practice exactly like they're supposed to do or, uh, and uh, uh, balancing their, their operation, and even if the appraisal districts are um, you know, not exactly uniform in their administration of it, and even if some landowners push the envelope, the condition is still better than it was pre-1991. And as you know, life itself comes from the landscape. I mean, that's where the plants are, that's where the waters come from, that's where oxygen is generated, that's where carbon is disposed of. So the healthier the landscape, the better for life on Earth is uh, for every creature that depends uh, on life on this Earth. So it is still better off than it was 30 years ago in all respects, 
but it still can be better. And that's what the Texas chapter and others are beginning to work on. Um, and the general public, you know, they basically haven't yet to realize that the blue bonnets don't grow over there in that asphalt. It's <laughs> out in the countryside where they grow. Yes, sir. Can you talk a little bit about um, the the legislation needs to be tweaked again and that there's a lot of support for that? Can you talk a little bit about what that might mean in the coming year or two? Actually, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that the legislation needs to be tweaked. The legislation may, in fact, need to be tweaked or it may, in fact, need to be okay. What the big issues are, are that the appraisal districts don't understand, don't understand it, f for the most part. There are some, there are some chief appraisers that understand every word and where every punctuation mark is. But there are a lot of appraisal districts all over Texas that are confused about it, how to administer it. And then there's all sorts of, of um, discussions and, and information available about how to qualify and how to satisfy the guidelines. And that, I think, needs to be tightened up a little bit so it's easier to understand so everybody knows what's going on. And remember, from the very beginning, you're supposed to work hard at your wildlife management yes, sir. operation. And you're supposed to do good things for your landscape. And if you are in agriculture, you're supposed to rest easier on the land. And if you're a new home buyer moving out of the city and buying your, your dream in the country, it's not supposed to become a sanctuary for feral hogs. There is supposed to be control of predators, and you're supposed to take care of things that, that destroy habitat as part of your plan. And a lot of that is not being done. I mean, a lot of the, it, it's really upsetting to a lot of us who've been involved in it for over 30 years that, that there are a lot of places that have wildlife management valuation that in fact are for, for feral hogs. And, some of the more detrimental species of free-ranging exotics, and that's not—that's never the intention. Uh, and, and now, feral hog hunting and exotic hunting bring a lot of revenue to the landowners. So right. we're not—we're not trying to disrupt that. We're just trying to make sure that everybody is doing an appropriate job, and that like they're supposed to be, doing good things for the landscape. Yes, sir. Sounds like there's a lot of opportunity for that kind of good land stewardship action as a part of the uh, valuation. As was originally intended. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from 98 to now is a long time for all those good intentions. I mean, there, you know, there are people out there operating that have the valuation that they don't, you know, they weren't even born when all this was started. And one of the big misunderstandings is, and this probably is the number one question about fixing something, why do you have to have an ag value to try for five years if, if there's no ag value to start with? Why do you have to get in agriculture for five years before you can get your wildlife management valuation? Mm -hmm. Well, the answer to that is the only way it was constitutional go back to 1995, the only way it was constitutional was it's an agricultural practice and you transfer one form of ag into another, just so, just exactly as if you had been raising sheep and goats and you want to start raising cattle. Yes, you sir. just transfer your ag, or if you want to have a, a peach orchard, or if you want to raise cutting horses, you transfer from one form of ag into another. That's the way you get into wildlife management. So these properties that, you know, that are being purchased that do not have an agricultural value, it's developing a lot of opposition to the program because the people can't get in it. Right. right away. Well, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, uh, but that's, I'm told that's still the only way it become, that it can be, uh, be constitutional. Yes, sir. That's one of the fixes that needs to be addressed, is can someone who is satisfying their idea of the American dream, their Texas dream, can they 
take their savings and buy a piece of land in the country and do good things for the wildlife species and human species that live there and maybe get a few cows or um, uh, get a good uh, grazing lease or to come in and bring a few cows to do their habitat management or can they just start out right away and do good things for wildlife and i would say that was a uh, a very a very worthy pursuit as long as it didn't end up being the same yeah, right yes sir do you have a sense of the percentage or the rate of um, uh, private property that does have a wildlife valuation throughout the state right now? Well, all I know is it has grown immeasurably. Mm -hmm. I think beyond anybody's expectations, certainly sitting around that borrowed dining room table in 1988. We had, I mean, it's, you know, there are, there are, there are groups that have seminars, uh, private and non-profit groups that have seminars about how to comply with this. It's promoted in all sorts of different areas. Uh, Parks and Wildlife, Extension Service, everybody fully understands and appreciates and, and wants it to grow. And uh, some are, there's all kinds of reasons why it's not growing, but as the, if I think we can solve all issues, particularly with the appraisal districts, um, I, I think it will it will end up being a whole lot better for everybody, and I don't want to give the appraisal districts a bad, too bad of a rap because, listen, the legislature is on them to squeeze every penny yes, sir. out of the taxpayers, and because basically to pay for all the public services and um, importantly education, so they're under a, 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 just a tremendous amount of pressure to raise the tax dollars that the state of Texas uses to pay for everything. So, you know, you can't blame them for trying to go out. Well, I guess maybe you might be able to blame some <laughs> because the big money is in all those big giant high rises in all the major cities downtown. I bet you one of those giant condos and office buildings in, this, in downtown have got more tax dollars in it than several of the rural counties combined. Mm -hmm. So that's where the tax money is, at least I could be incorrect. But, you know, there, obviously there are people who are not doing their ag value correctly and they're not doing their wildlife value correctly. And, and that's the, what we're going to try to fix. That's wonderful. And what are some of the ways that make you hopeful and optimistic that those um, issues can be addressed and fixed? Well, because there are a lot of young 20 year olds that are getting involved and taking it over. So all of us old people can kind of sit back and relax and let all the, all the next generations, <laughs> plural, start taking over and start working on this. I'm really excited about the Tier Institute of the Texas chapter of the Wildlife Society, I think that they've got some, I had a little conference call with some of their leadership, uh, two of them in the last week, and I'm very positive and excited about what some of their ideas might be. And uh, I think ideas are not only will help the Texas situation, but are definitely uh, exportable to other states that might be so inclined. That's wonderful, and I, um, that was actually going to be another question to talk about um, the idea of exporting this really brilliant, innovative idea to other states around the nation. Um, what, it sounds like you, you think there's real potential for that. Uh, I think there's a potential for that, as does the Texas chapter, all the professional wildlife folks. And once we get the, you know, once we get agriculture on board, I think it's exportable everywhere, particularly if they model the program after our program, which was to, to use your agricultural practice to do better things for the landscape than you might have to if the appraisal district is forcing you to do the wrong things. So that's the major fix that need, needs to be done elsewhere. How to do that. Uh, I believe everybody will jump on board. Wonderful. Wouldn't that be neat? It's really neat to think of, again, a, such a, a, a brilliant, innovative program starting right here in our home state of Texas and being useful to other landowners across the nation. Well, 
Texas Wildlife Association has a history of that. Mm -hmm. Your dad was one of the signers of the uh, the memorandum of understanding between the Texas Wildlife Association and the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department for the Texas Youth Hunting Program, and it's expanded from where it began in 1991. You know, here 30 years later, there are any number of states that follow that model exactly. And so it, we're, we have a, we already have a model to follow to expand to other states where there are programs already in place done by the public-private partnership in Texas. Wonderful. And what a wonderful um, uh, precedent that that program set for, like you said, um, expanding other really useful and effective programs to other states across the nation. Absolutely. All right, well that was pretty exciting. Sure Thank you for, for joining our session of Leopold Live. Uh, again, uh, we'd like to thank all those uh, speakers and those that participated with our session. Uh, look for upcoming sessions over the course of the next year. And our, per our hope is to cover these very specific topics that are of interest to landowners and natural resource managers. That's right. And I'd like to thank once again the Natural Resources Institute for coming out here and helping us provide this valuable information. Um, at Bamberger Ranch Preserve, we hope to have our programming, including our workshops and tours, uh, back up and running by the fall, depending on how things go. Uh, so make sure to wa watch for both the Texas A&M Natural Resources Institute and Bamberger Ranch Preserve on your social media channels. And make sure to uh, check in every once in a while and see what we're up to.